Welcome into another episode of Office Hours. Today I am joined by Jeff Reese, GM of Yahoo Sports. And Jeff started in the media business in 1987. Here we are now running Yahoo Sports. It may seem like a while, but it probably went by in an instant. What, uh, what's what been at least the one constant over the last uh, career of yours? Um, first of all, thank you very much for having me here. Um, I mean, I think for me the biggest constant is that I have been unbelievably lucky to spend almost – the entirety of that time working on products and for and for audiences of which I'm a huge fan of, um, you know, and 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 having the good fortune, whether whether it was and most of the time has been within the sports industry, but whether it was within sports or the first five years I spent in media working for a kind of an upstart uh, or six years upstart satirical magazine here in New York, um, I've been able to, to to work on things that just as a consumer I go crazy for. Um, so it's a, it's code for saying in many instances I would have worked for free, but I'm pretty glad to hear you know that my bosses never knew that. <laughs> Luckily, they did pay you. Exactly. <laughs> I, it was it was nice to get paid. Yeah, along got, the way. and part of that was I would say a divergent from media, but a part of what would be content and, and the PBA. Talk sure. us through what was that like going and running the the PBA for two years. Every, it was recently sold. Yeah, too. yeah. Every I mean every sports fan should should have a chance of running a sports league at some point <laughs> in their life because it it's a, it's an unbelievable treat and you know that particular league had its own unique set of, of both assets and challenges. Um, the PBA at one point, um, this goes back to the 1960s, generated higher national television ratings than college football did. And through a, a combination of things, demographic shifts, um, some, some curious you know, steps along the way, um, it, 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 it had been relegated to a lower tier of sports rights. Um, the, the, the guys who, who bought it in, in the early 2000s, um, have just engineered a successful outcome for themselves by selling it to Bullmore. They have a healthy television relationship with the Fox Network, who does a terrific job presenting the sport. And, you know, the, the thesis when I ran it and, and, it, and, it, and it ultimately came true was that there would be an appetite among network uh, programmers for a tier of sports rights that could, that, could, that, that could basically fill a large volume of hours with good quality, consistent programming um, at a level of economics that weren't going uh, weren't, weren't to bust up the budget. Um, and they've done a terrific job. Is there an example of a similar league nowadays that you feel like can fit something like that, right? Obviously, I, was, like I said last week, we had in the guy from the Professional Fighters League. You have Premier Lacrosse League. Is there another league like that that we can become, I wouldn't say a filler, but has that opportunity to take over that type of space? I think there, I think there are a ton of them, um, and I think you know the, it, the the key in all of them is is, is being able to manage uh, it, it. It's being able to kind of hit um, a convergence point in terms of being able to to to, to manage kind of a, a sane level of economics in terms of how you present the sport, and being able to present something that can engage audiences um, for a bunch of hours. Um, a hot dog eating contest may give ESPN a good rating on the Fourth of July. But uh, and, and it may be something that a fan can relate to at some level, but it's sure going to be a tough, a tough struggle getting somebody to watch that for 30 weeks. So finding something that somebody can connect with, that, that somebody can relate to, that can, that can produce that consistent quality programming, um, I think there are a couple of things out there. I mean, certainly things like the NWSL um, is, a, is, a, is a strong example, but then you get into a set of really challenging economics. Soccer teams are more expensive to, to run and and certainly, if you want to pay those athletes who are elite athletes at the at the top of their of their sport, not just a living wage, but but a, a, a real wage, it, it it then starts inviting um, challenging economics. What do you think? Maybe some of the solve for those economics and for the, the ability to have something like the NWSL or some of these other upstart leagues have the chance to succeed. Um, I think the best thing that they have going for them right now is just the, the the number of distribution platforms that are in the market right now trying to connect with audiences. And I think you know some of the things that the the folks at Flow Sports have come on, I think are are, are at least it's a smart thesis, right? Which is can can you start to roll up a bunch of of niche sports together and and that are that are traditionally underserved and create a greater a greater you know some of their parts. And I think that's the that's the best chance they have. I think one of the things we all didn't quite figure out at the advent of digital sports and, and just fundamentally got wrong is to a degree, I think a lot of us thought that that the advent of, of digital sports and 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 the lessening of barriers of distribution 
um, we're going to be kind of a force for democratization in sports and create more opportunities for second and third tier sports to emerge. In reality, the strengthening of those platforms actually, if anything, calcified the, 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 the separation between the elite sports and the sports that could extract enormous amounts of money out of the marketplace and those, and those other guys. Because the thing we didn't really count on was how difficult discovery was going to be. And, and it's interesting because no matter who I talk to, whether they be a rights holder, whether it be a network, um, there isn't anybody out there who isn't struggling at some level with discovery across a key demo. It could be the NBA and, and, younger, and, and younger fans or, or the NFL or, and, and women. So, you know, it just it, – it, we thought the tough part of the solve was capturing the contest and, and getting a good presentation of it. And, and you know, that's just the beginning. Getting, getting, getting people to watch stuff is really hard. Yeah. And, it's, and get, this just in, right? It's getting harder. Yeah. Especially, I mean, look, if you think about it, the, the juxtaposition between the AAF and the XFL and just between who's watching it and where they're watching it, right? You have CBS Sports Network, which is no offense to them, but a little bit different than, say, an ABC, ESPN, Fox proper, right? And then that's like a perfect example as to from a ratings differentiation. A hundred percent. And I think what, what you're also dead on there there is to also say how powerful – still just serendipitous discovery is. And the fact is, if you own a big piece of real estate, even if it's in a dumb conventional, <laughs> you know, we, we've, you know, we've all pronounced these linear network, you know, linear, linear networks kind of dinosaurs. Well, not so much because, because they do aid discovery. And, and, and it, it, it speaks to still, you know, in 2020, a decent percentage of what we watch are things we stumble upon, yeah. not necessarily things that are, that are, that are the consequence of a, of a, of a, of a specific, you know, mission to go find program X. Yeah. And as part of, you know, your now role, right? You're at Yahoo. You've been there for the last two years, got a lot of stuff going on. And it's funny because, and I'm going to pull a little note from what would be your LinkedIn bio. You say, I oh, help God. build next generation digital media businesses by marrying great consumer experiences with the right biz model, distribution strategy, and development approach. Why is Yahoo the next great digital media business? Well, I, it's a great question. And, and I desperately need to go to LinkedIn and make sure there's not any. <laughs> I didn't think that was a bad one. I didn't think I, that was a bad I, one. I, Whatever. Um, I, I think because especially look at what we're doing in gaming right now and what we're doing in, in, in the early stages of our partnership uh, with BetMGM and, and, and betting. And I think it is because we have an ability to really zero in on specific areas of, of, of fans' lives, of their fandom that they are most passionate about. Um, we're of the mind that, that, that fans are most passionate about the teams they follow, their favorite athletes, and, and, and we as fans – believe, rightly or wrongly, that we know more than other people do. And by the way, if you're a fan of certain New York teams, you're probably right, um, that we know more about how to run a team and what should be happening than, than, than people who are sitting in the front office. So our ability to be able to, to, to drive great coverage of your, of your team, to help you organize that coverage of being able to provide you know, the best fantasy platform out there, um, our, our ability to deliver, you know, a, an unparalleled slate of, 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 of NFL games live to you um, on a free basis and our ability to connect that all with, with fantasy um, is unrivaled in the industry. And you guys have had fantasy for now, last year's 20 years, right? This year's the 20th year of the this fantasy. This will be our 21st season, 21st season of fantasy season football fantasy coming football. into 2020. Uh, last year's 20th, 6% uptick based off of mm -hmm. what I had heard. For you guys, fantasy versus gambling, complementary, adjacent, intersecting, how do you guys kind of break that down in terms of where you see it going? Yup, yup, yup. Um, you know, I think they, they both touch on, on different parts of, of a fan's mind. Um, you know, I think the, the, the biggest thing that, that I think folks don't appreciate about fantasy football is it's about football, but it's also very much a, a, about a social dy dynamic between you and the other people in your league. Whether, whether those folks were are roommates now or were roommates once or family members or, or, or folks that you served in the military with, um, former work, workmates, right? It is a phenomenal way to keep a group of people together. Um, and it also focuses in on, on, on by far the, the most powerful and important sport played in the United States. Um, but, but folks who don't understand that juxtaposition of the social dynamic along with just the, the nature of football – have a tendency to only serve, you know, a part of that fan's appetite. Some of those dynamics clearly spill into sports betting. 
I think what we're going to see with sports betting is 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 we're going to see a relatively you know, a relatively sharp kind of binary difference in terms of a fan's predisposition to, to, to partake in betting. First and foremost, right, there's going to be a, a, a very clear line as to whether or not they live in a place that legally permits it. Yep. Um, but secondly, there's going to be more of a psychographic thing that says, I'm either a better or I'm not. And what our job is going to be is to do everything we can to, to enhance the experience for somebody who's inclined to bet. I think we have a particular role in that in that ecosystem in that industry that's different. I don't think Yahoo Sports is going to be the place where um, the hardcore guy lays his fifty thousand dollars down on on a Super Bowl bet, or yeah. or or a maniacal better feels like she's got to put down a thousand dollars a night on the NBA. I think we're going to be a place where where, where fans are, are are involved in a more casual, more kind of spontaneous na- uh, nature. But at the same time, if you're not a better um, we're not gonna we're not gonna you know pollute that experience for you and try to make you do something you're not inclined to do because that's the quickest way to disenfranchise that fan. What has the early data been like between both of those? If you can share in terms of just like what you've seen from a fan who is inclined to bet in terms of overall engagement with the platform and the other you know properties inside of Yahoo. We just don't have enough data points to really work off of that. I mean, we basically went live in the middle of November in a fairly modest use case in the state of New Jersey. As we start to open up new territories in Indiana, West Virginia, Colorado, as it comes uh, as it comes to open later this year, we'll have a greater understanding. What we do have is a fairly healthy dose of research that gives us an idea of, of fan attitudes about what they are already doing, whether it be legally. In many cases, these guys are involved in in what I would call kind of quasi legal or outright not legal betting activity, and I think you know that there's an opportunity for us to convert them over to a to a cleaner, brighter, well lit well well lit room. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, we have we have every confidence to believe that that there is a, a meaningful kind of critical mass of of fans who we're gonna be able to convert over into being Yahoo Sports Bet um, Bet MGM customers. What's the go to market strategy like for for you guys as you open up with these new territories? Because now, I mean, it's it is a it's a it's a land rush, right? I mean, you're, everyone's everyone's. I need this person. I need this person. It's now Barstool Sportsbook versus yep. Yahoo Sportsbook. What's that point of differentiation and how you guys kind of go into market? I think for us, it's twofold, right? One is is it's going to start first and foremost by serving our existing fans. Um, you know, a lot of the folks who are going to be looking to build betting share, particularly among the the traditional operators. Um, have had to go through very costly forms of external acquisition to drive folks into their into their, into their environment. Um, and our starting place is going to be to say, gosh, you know, we've got 13, 14 million people coming through Yahoo Sports on an NFL Sunday. Let's start by talking to them. Let's start about, you know, let's start with, with how do we remove as much of the friction possible between what's already bringing them into a terrific environment to consume sports and, and other things they can be doing. So it's going to be, you know, first and foremost about that, about how we manage that conversion process um, and, 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 and really take advantage of, of a unique proposition we have in the market. What do you think about, speaking about the Barstool Penn National deal, what do you think about that in the grand scheme of things of media overall in terms of just, I guess, trends and kind of how you view things playing out? Um, it, it fits, you know, it, I, first and foremost, I see it as a validation of our strategy. Yeah. Um, you know, these are complementary pieces coming together. Um, at different points, we've heard different levels of noise coming from the traditional betting operators as to, as to whether or not they're going to engage in, in creating content organizations. And, and there's frequently a moment of, of fuss and noise and hullabaloo. And then as soon as numbers start getting hard, you know, for them, they start withdrawing from that. So Content's diff- not easy. Oh, it's a, it's, it's a, it's a pain in the butt, yeah. right? And, and it's particularly hard if you haven't done it before. So, so I think increasingly, you know, we've seen these operators turn to, to more content-oriented partners. A similar deal happened between William Hill and CBS uh, last week or the week before. Yeah. Um, and, they, and they make perfect sense. Um, from the media entity's point of view, um, there is an awful lot of complexity involved with, with being an operator. Um, not just complexity, but regulatory scrutiny that, that is... Um, distasteful and difficult for most media um, entities to engage in, at least at the at the get go of these businesses. So it makes sense to offload 
um, some subset of that onto their operating partner. Now, you guys, I'm assuming when you went out and, and were talking to these operating partners, you probably had a lot of options. Why do you felt like Bet MGM made the most sense? And, and theoretically, you probably had an opportunity to take money from a lot of them. But why was it more of like, hey, let's let's get in bed and do this the right way, and not like, hey, we'll just do here, some here, some here, some here, some here. Um, that's a great question, and it really starts with with the people. And we met great, you know, we met great people throughout the industry. Um, and it was a really interesting and, 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 and fun process. But at the end of the day, um, we believe that the leadership at Bet, um, at Bet MGM, Adam Greenblatt, the leadership at, at, at MGM, folks like Scott Butera, um, were the people we wanted to work with because we all may have a notion in our head in terms of how this industry is going to work. I guarantee you 90% of what we think in February of 2020 is not going to be the way things work in February of 23. So at the end of the day, being able to work with people, being able to work within a, within a system that's going to be agile, um, that's going to be able to adapt to market conditions that are going to evolve in ways that we, we simply, you know, can't necessarily we, – we can plan for the fact that it's going to be different, but we can't plan for every scenario. So it means working with a partner who's incredibly well equipped to, to handle a series of, 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 of you know, real – movement within the industry and working with people who you can just enjoy a super high level of communication with. Do you have a feeling there'll be a physical manifestation of the Yahoo sports book at some point? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, there, there, there already are in terms of some pop-up senses. I mean, we did some really cool things, um, with our, with our partners at MGM in Las Vegas, um, during Super Bowl weekend. Um, at, at places like Mandalay Bay. And while they didn't, you know, rename the sports book, but we had signage all over the place. We had, we had video setups places. And I think, you know, again, it's, it's amazing to me. It, it is a great question because it's amazing to me how, you know, we look at other scenarios and we accept them as being kind of the norm, yet we, 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 we continue to look at kind of vestigial thinking or use vestigial thinking around questions like this. The, we, we, as consumers are all delighted by the notion, particularly in the holidays, for example, of pop-up stores, yeah. you know, pop-up experiences, whether they be in urban areas or at places like South by or other, other places where folks gather, but we don't really think about, well, what could that mean in terms of, of how you run a sports book? So I, I don't need to have a, 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 a standing retail space, someplace that's going to sit empty 250 days a year. What, what I certainly would hope that we're going to get really smart about is to say, okay, there's going to be a huge convergence of fans at this particular event, at this particular time. How do we work with our friends at MGM to create the best pop-up experience around that? And then when it's done, we, we fold up our, our carnival tent and we move on and do the next one. And so I would sure hope that we do stuff like that. So safe to say uh, NFL draft in a few months is going to be a big thing for you guys. Yeah, hope, well, I mean, again, I mean, that's less of a pop up because our partner has the has the largest yeah. physical footprint in Las Vegas of, of of any entity out there. So, with everything going this way, a lot of operators wanting to be involved with media, a lot of media trying to get involved with operators. What do you think is the sauce or or is the formula? And you mentioned you, we don't know yet, but that wins out, right? Is it a mix of audience and and a good operator? Is it a mix of a brand like Yahoo, like? Is this going to be something where <clears throat> there's 10 winners or there's three winners by the time we're all done with this? They're not going to be 10 winners. Um, and, and the secret sauce is going to be the secret sauce of anything, right? It's going to be who provides the fan with, with the most differentiated and fun experience. Um, the, the, the biggest thing to keep in mind when you're working in a, in a, in a field like sports um, is regardless of whether you're talking about sports betting or you're talking about fantasy football or you're talking about just how you're covering the Houston Astros right now is that our fans are coming to us for a form of escapism. They're coming here to get away from stories about viruses and global warming and, and impeachment or whatever else, right? This is an escape. And, and if you cannot provide escapism, if you cannot make it a fun experience, and, and that, that fun has to be functional in terms of what I mentioned before, in terms of how frictiony the experience is, it has to be entertaining. Um, it's going to be about who who can really provide the fan of a fun time. It it just it's it's not you know obviously the most fun a fan can have is they win every bet. Of course, well, that's 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 not going to happen. Yeah. I don't I Unless don't something's win. rigged. <laughs> exactly, it's just not going to happen. But but I do believe that there's a a fair amount of room as to how much fun the fan has in that experience. So you know, can we make it more social? Can we make it more spontaneous? Can we make it connect better to the things that the fan is watching at that particular moment? 
are all places where there is room for meaningful differentiation in this category. And for you guys, obviously, you have the NFL streaming opportunity. You mentioned it already. We'd love for you to talk a little bit about it. But is there an opportunity for you to go out and now find other, maybe, like you said, flow sport-like opportunities where you're finding other of these sports that you could stream alongside live betting opportunities inside the app or on the site? It's certainly something that we, we are thinking about. Um, I don't exactly know how I mean, the range of economic outcomes there between what, what you know top tier versus lower tier cost, uh, sports rights could cost. But I think certainly there there is an opportunity, and this is this is this is this is also why this particular moment is 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 just is just so fantastic from my perspective. Um, you know, I have never worked in an environment that offers a greater variety of more exciting things that are converging together in terms of of helping shape the next generation of of, of fan experiences out there. Right. The the, the key drivers there are are one in no particular order. We have amazing new technological capability coming to bear, right? The, the wide scale availability of something like 5G, what happens when you plug 5G into a, into a, into a mech, a, a local you know, edge, edge computing network in terms of reducing some of these latencies and being able to sync those video signals and some of those uh, other experiences unprecedented. At the same time, you have a, a, a repealing of sports betting laws with PAPS a couple of years ago, unlocks a whole type of, 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 of kinds of experiences, plus the, just the sheer quality of, of, of sports as we know it now, the, the, the sheer quality of the athletic capabilities, whether they be basketball players or baseball players or football players, makes this a, a kind of unique moment in sports um, and, and you know, opens up all these conversations, right, that, 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 that we're talking about right now in terms of how you marry some of these different emerging capabilities together, whether it be betting and 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 next gen you know 5g driven consumption or 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 particular things around subs because now there's also a wide scale acceptance on the fans part in terms of saying i will pay for something you know there were there were big questions not that long ago as to what fans were willing to pay for and and the fans have made it clear they will they will they will they we right will spend to fuel our passions so it's just this incredible moment of opportunity right now. Do you guys think you'll have some sort of subscription product at, at some point? Or we already do. Yeah. We have a terrific subscription product right now around Rivals. Yeah. We are we are the leading place right now for folks to find out what's going on with their favorite college team, um, who they're looking at, who who your who your who your arch enemy is looking at, and um, you know we have we have I mean we have terrific reporters who are out there bird dogging college basketball and college football games, so that you know the the fun part about you watch the way we cover the NBA draft, we, you watch the way we cover the NFL draft, those athletes that are being picked in the first round are folks our brands have had relationships with since they were juniors, seniors, freshmen in high school. These aren't folks who just we just heard of 10 minutes ago. So you know we're able to talk about these, the, the, these folks with a level of depth and background that's different than anybody else out there. Do you think there's some sort of betting integration into that as well? In the rivals, you know, you got to be a little careful there, certainly not on the high school level. Yeah. But, you know, certainly I think there's an opportunity for us to plug um, our hardest core fans and rivals in with betting opportunities for sure. So what does the ecosystem look like going forward for you guys from a growth standpoint? You know, you have the betting, you have on site. What else is, is it the journalism side that's now supporting it too with like little reporters like Chris Haynes? Like how do you kind of see this mix going for Yahoo Sports? It's, it's a great question and, and really I, I would answer it. There's a, there's a micro ecosystem and a macro ecosystem, right? The, the micro ecosystem is the one you're talking about which, which lives within the world of Yahoo Sports and it's, it's what we do with fantasy. It's what we do with original content. It's what we do with our partnerships with folks like the NBA and NFL and Major League Baseball. There's also a broader macro ecosystem. Don't forget, we're plugged into a network where tens upon tens of millions of people are getting their mail every day, where tens of millions of people are getting their finance news. They're, you know, we are the leading source for, for online news anywhere. So you know, our job is to, is to both create, you know, and these are all you know, BS, you know, buzzy words, but flywheels within that, within that Yahoo Sports ecosystem, but also to get better at, 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 at providing value to folks who, you know, are interested in sports outside our system and, and, and bring some of them in, into Yahoo Sports as well. From a product standpoint, how do you see things playing out? I know you mentioned that, you know, daily long, or not daily, long-term, season-long NFL fantasy is pretty much, you know, not plateaued. It's still growing, but there's only so much growth there. 
from the betting side and the fantasy side, what are some of those products you feel rolling out? I know you mentioned one previously, but that you guys are going to take to market as segment of an opportunity to capture maybe what would be a casual fan or a casual fan in the moment at one of these pop-ups? Well, I think, you know, I, 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 would, I would dispute a little bit of the notion that, that, that fantasy is plateaued. Um, while, while the growth is slower year over year and, 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 and you're not going to see, you're not going to see a Kager there that's, that's, that's bigger than betting. Yeah. When you're starting with the base that you are, if you can, if you can post five, 10% growth on an annual basis off of a base that big, it is meaningful. Two is, and, and this is something we have not done a very good job of, is we have what I would call a singular relationship with a lot of those season long fantasy football players. It's kind of a one size fits all experience. And I think there's room for us to start super serving um, the hardest core kind of subset of those fans with with potentially premium products that really help them gain an even deeper um, competitive edge within their league. We all know, you know, if you're a fantasy player, the, the first question you ask if you get invited to join a new league or if you're talking to a friend about their league is to say, well, how hardcore is that league? Right, because there's some leagues where I'm told I've I've never actually done this myself. People play for money, um, and there 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 can be high stakes, or there could just be high levels of bragging rights. And there's some leagues that are more casual. Crazy punishments too. A, a crazy punishments, rituals. Uh, that we have a ritual internal internally that the the loser of our product league, for example, has to wear a very ugly and garish uh, temporary tattoo. And that gets applied during a very public all hands meeting. Um, it's amazing. But, yeah. So no, absolutely right. So so I think, you know, I think beyond just growing the base of people playing this game, which I think we've demonstrated is possible, there is a next step of being able to, to, to go deeper in terms of how we serve a, a segment of those fans. And then we are always looking for other games. We, we, we launched a little over a year ago uh, a game called Yahoo Fantasy Slate that's basically just a, 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 a casual daily kind of props game. Um, we launched a new best ball product. So we're, we're, we're constantly looking for new ways of engaging fans and I think um, you know, are, are, are always going to be doing that. How, feel, how, how important do you feel the product side is to everything for you guys as a whole, and just in terms of being able to tap into all of that, right? That's an advantage that you would probably be understated to not really like – like that's an advantage that most media companies don't have is like the true product engine. Well, I, th- I think the, the the marriage of of product and content is is at the at the core of what of of what makes these products great. We have a a not just a terrific heritage, but a, but an active and actual, you know, excellent product practice um, across Verizon Media right now. But but I feel particularly strongly about what we do in sports, um, and you look at. Um, the level of, you know, the, the, the types of, of, of grades or ratings our consumers give us, particularly um, on our mobile products, on our, on our Yahoo Sports app in both, uh, in, in, in both iOS and in Android, um, they're off the charts good. And it, it is because, you know, you, you, you can't have one without the other. You can't have great content and a crap product. You can't have a great product that has crap content. So you have to be able to fire on, on on both of those. Speaking of that mix, what does it look like for you guys from a from a you know just overall focus perspective from the app to digital to on site? How does that kind of break down? What is it you guys are optimizing towards? Is it you want people to download? Is it I want people on the website or how do you kind of look at that? We've over the course of the past year, we've put a lot of energy into the app because that was a that was an area of of some degree of neglect. Um, at the company over the last couple of years, and 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 I think we've 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 addressed that really well. Um, the, the 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 growth we've gotten in terms of numbers, the the qualitative ratings we get from from users are, are off the charts good. Um, right now, our our biggest focus is going to be on continuing to serve that kind of what we call that top of the funnel, that basic fan coming in, but but really focusing in on how we best managing their conversion to, to, to deeper and more engaged products like, like what we're doing with sports betting. What have you seen, at least some early parts of the testing from converting from that casual fan to someone who's deeper involved with, with Yahoo? What is it? What is the trigger? What is something that you guys have found without giving away your secret sauce? I don't think, you know, I think it's somewhat naive to think that yep. you're going to convert a casual fan into a serious fan. I think the, 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 the bigger trick there, Adam, is to say, you know, as sports fans, right, we, we, we are all over the place. So it's not about turning somebody who kind of likes sports into being a sports nut. It's about turning somebody who 
is is using a bunch of different sports properties, but but our share of that sports fan is maybe ten or fifteen percent, and turning them into a fifty percent or seventy percent or ninety percent user, and that's really about getting a greater doing a greater job of really kind of capturing the signals that they're giving us. Who are their favorite teams? Who are their favorite players? What 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 are they looking at most? And doing a better job of making sure that we're delivering an experience that reflects um, their clearly demonstrated appetite. How has the app and the emphasis on the app helped that? I, I think the app lends itself to to how we organize that content. I think we're we're in early days in terms of how we manage that initiative. But the app gives you a metaphor just in the way it's constructed because it's very much biased towards this notion of your favorite teams. Um, and 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 I think it, it it's well positioned to drive exactly that. We've talked about a f- couple media trends, but from your standpoint, what is something that, you know, or a couple things that maybe you're buying and then maybe a few things that you're selling? So what are you really excited about and what do you think? Uh, it's a little bit of buzzword flywheel type. I wouldn't, I wouldn't say, I wouldn't say that, that esports is a buzzword or if, I, I, I don't know how to, I don't know how to serve that fan. Hmm. Um, I think that, that the, I think that the, from my point of view, that that the tricky thing about the category is that somebody somewhere along the line, you know, the, the term esports is a really cool is a really cool term, but it 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 suggests a connection with sports that may not really be there. It's as if somebody decided early on, right, that that you know competitive card playing should be called you know card sports, and and that would suddenly just well, what are you doing with card sports? Because you're sport. So I, I don't know, you know, the, the, how adjacent and how much overlap um, there, there is there. Um, you know, in terms of, of the more traditional sports, you know, I, I read something the other day where, you know, I think something like 27 NBA teams are seeing uh, local ratings declines. There, there's been much discussion about their national ratings declines and stuff like that. And I think it is dangerously simplistic to look at a to look at one vestigial measure as as a as kind of a um, vital sign as to the relationship fans have with a particular sport, I think if you could, you know, if you could look at the way we consume LeBron James today versus the way we consumed Kobe Bryant twenty years ago, um, the number of different touch points, the number of different places we intersect with LeBron has so fundamentally changed. And not all of them are being captured or reflected in a traditional television rating. So to me, I think one of the more interesting things that we're going to see happen in sports over the course of the next 10 years is how we measure the value and the impact of those of those different forms of consumption and how the folks who own the IP around that, whether it be teams or leagues or LeBron himself, um, can do a better job of, of ultimately capturing that value. Yeah, it just becomes down to sheer number of options, right? Even someone like me, a huge Arizona Coyotes fan, not a ton of those oh, out there. You're the one? Yeah, I'm the one. Wow, I've, uh, I've never... I've, I've ne- I've, no one's uh, ever met I, one, I, I especially to, on the East Coast. I need to take... A, how did that happen? Uh, from Arizona originally, okay. born and raised. Um, I never played an ounce of ice hockey in my entire life, but for some reason, just that's like of you, all the Arizona teams. That's you never you team. never saw ice that wasn't in a drinking glass. That's it, right? <laughs> for most of my life. Um, so, But even something like that, right? I... Yes, I have NHL.com, but I'm watching the highlights. I'm not watching the full mm-hmm. games, or maybe I'll have a chance to full watch the full games. And you're right. It's something that I feel like people are still interacting with sports the same, if not probably more than they used to be just because of the options. But, you know, the traditional big number that gets the headlines, you said, doesn't tell all the story. I think it goes beyond that, Adam. I, I think that, you know, one of my favorite questions to, to ask people, and, and, and you've kind of jumped into it, right, is, okay, are you a sports fan? Yeah, okay, great. On a, on a, who's your favorite team? Of whatever, I'll, somebody will say the Golden State Warriors or something. I'll say, oh, on a scale of one to ten, you ten is you live with the Warriors. Every you know, you you will name your next child Steph, regardless of, <laughs> of of whatever. And you know how serious you. And they'll say, I'm an eight or a nine. I'll say, okay, well, how many games do you watch a year? And they'll say, you know, I'll watch parts of fifteen or ten this year, two. And and it's interesting because I I genuinely believe if you if you had asked that same question of a fan twenty years ago. And, the, and, and their answer was eight or nine. They would have said they watched 40 games or 35 games. So I think you're absolutely right. I think that we're at this really interesting moment where 
I think the, the level of avidity has not necessarily changed, but, but the, the different ways that, that, that avidity kind of manifests itself and the different signals we take in to drive it has, has evolved. And not all of them are easily captured uh, from a monetary point of view. No, especially because you have different channels, right? Yeah, you, you were in one of them, right? 100%. Twitter, right? You spend time there. 100. And... And, and and listen, Twitter is an amazing product, but it's also the world's largest repository of of content that that you know basically royalty free content from the part of the platform. It's an it's an amazing thing that all these years later that Twitter has managed to still basically, you know, where where if you're if you're an ESPN or an NBA. You don't you don't give your content away for free any place, but you're okay about doing it there. How's what's your guys' relationship with the social platforms? How do you see that evolving? And, and is the app and this is something you know someone else from another company mentioned that they're trying to you know turn their app into a, a social network? Is that something that you guys are looking at as you guys grow the the emphasis on the app? I think it's an important it's an important way for us to reach fans. I think it's it's you know Sarah Crennan, who runs our content team, has done an amazing job over the course of the last year. Um, basically making up for some lost time. It had been an area of historical under um, underinvestment for us, and she hired a, a, a terrific social team. And it's done a couple things for us. One is it's been a it's it's been a place where we've been able to develop and test drive some new approaches to our brand's voice. Um, it's been a great a, a great kind of lab for us to kind of, of of work on some new ways of talking to sports fans that I think you know you've already seen start to find their way into the into the core product. Guys like Matt Harmon, who kind of came to us from from somewhat of a, of a of a social point of view, is now one of our leading um, one of our leading presenters within fantasy. Um, and and yes, it remains a super important way for us to engage um, certain demos um, that that we have historically not done as good a job with, um, particularly on emerging platforms or even less emerging platforms, but just places like Instagram. So, you know, it's, it's an important part of the mix. I don't think it is going to, I don't think a social network is going to supplant our, our O&O property as a primary means of delivering stuff simply because, A, um, our, our rights holders are more restrict, or, or, or the rights grantors that we work with are more restrictive in terms of what we can do there. And, and secondly, we just don't have as, as, as strong a path to, to monetizing that. But it, it's an important part of the strategic mix. You mentioned rights and, and what's going on there. Obviously, the, the biggest story is the impending you know, NFL negotiations and how that's going to happen. How are you guys preparing for it? How do you see it? What does it look like from a, from a Yahoo Verizon standpoint? Uh, you know, yes, absolutely. We're, we're, we're involved in internal processes right now, figuring out um, you know, where we play there. Um, the NFL is a hugely important partner of ours. Um, they've been an important, they're an important partner to a, a number of different entities across Verizon. Um, you know, we, we, we've worked with the NFL, for example, to make it one of the forefront places where we've been deploying 5G networks ahead of virtually anywhere. So, you know, we, we go at those conversations probably differently than almost anybody else because we have so many different touch points from, from both what we can do on a, on a, on a technical infrastructure point of view to what we can do um, in terms of deepening Verizon's relationships with its wireless customers. So it's something we're pretty deep in right now. And and one of those things, and I think you told Mike, uh, one of our reporters, you guys were expected, you guys said you were expected to double your NFL revenue in 2019. How did that end up for you? Uh, We did. Nice. And and, and what for you was the, the catalyst to that? Um, a combination of things. I think we, we had more touch points. We added the Yahoo Sports app, uh, the Yahoo Fantasy app uh, to our distribution points. Uh, I think we were further ahead, so we had more, we had more eyeballs. Um, I think we were further ahead in our sales development cycle. Um, we got to market earlier, and I, st- I still believe that there is, there's room for us to have significant growth in, in 2020. Where do you see that growth coming? Um, again, even, even, even deeper levels of sales and even, you know, the, the sales is a relatively, you know, the math here is relatively easy, yeah. right? We have supply and, 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 and it comes down to how much demand you can create. And I think we will, we will grow our supply and I think we will be able to drive more demand. And you talked about places that you have started to invest in. Where are some other areas in, in 2020 that you feel like Yahoo's going to maybe hit that historically under invest in that you guys are going to invest more in? Um, you know, again, the, 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 main, the main focus right now is going to be driving adoption um, of, of, of sports betting and, and premium gaming. So I think, you know, we will, we will, make, we will make real investments in terms of how we, in, in, in terms of how we drive, how we really get good 
at, at, at being able to figure out what the, what the deepest level of relationship we can have with the consumer and how to, how to kind of, you know, get them into, into some form of premium gaming or betting. You look back now and, and you say, well, well, a year from now, what is, what is a successful 2020 um, alongside the betting and what you guys have there? What does a successful 2020 look like for, for Yahoo and Yahoo Sports in particular? Um, I think it, it cuts a couple different ways. I think, you know, what I described earlier, right, being able to work more effectively within – we Verizon Media is this enormous company and, you know – Helps to have that type of that resources. And, and, and we do a inconsistently good job of availing ourselves of those assets. So, you know, perfect example, um, you got to think – that some subset of the incredibly smart, highly qualified people who use the Yahoo Finance app every day um, might be interested in something like the college basketball tournament coming up next month or might be interested in something around sports betting. How do we do a better job of, of, of unlocking that customer? Um, how do we do a better job of sports being able to serve the audience across the, the, the Yahoo homepage environment? Um, how do we do a better job of, again, taking those millions of fantasy football players, many of whom have either a, a strong predisposition to betting or are already doing that and moving them into the Yahoo Sports environment, or Yahoo Sports bet environment, that is quite simply a better place for them to do um, to do that than other places they, they might be already playing. Now, for you personally, you've been Twitter, PBA, ESPN, Newsweek. What's been so excited about, exciting about this opportunity of Verizon and then just, you know, the time you think uh, ahead of you? Um, it, it goes back to, to, to that notion that there's, there's literally never been a moment in sports that presents a greater degree of, of, open, of open field than we have right now. The idea that, that something like sports betting is a large enough opportunity that has a, it has a chance for us to kind of restack the hierarchy of the category. It has a, I, I have always been lucky in my career to be at the forefront of kind of developing relationships between products and, and consumers based on new forms of technology or, or, or new, new capabilities in terms of reaching them. And the combination of what we're going to be able to do with betting and the advent of, of the new technology that's coming to market has, has created this, this kind of kismity, you know, wonderful kind of moment of opportunity.